This is Air Force Oral History Interview number 1361 with Otis F. Bryan. The interview dates are 14 and 15 December 1982, and the interview was conducted in Greeley, Kansas by Dr. James C. Hasdor. This is tape two of four, and both sides are recorded. Uh, borrowed a large amount of money from some of the banks, including the Mellon Bank. And in the late 50s, Howard then made a big order for jets from Boeing, Boeing 707s. And what actually became uh, the main trouble was he got overextended and couldn't meet his obligations, even though all the money he used to come he was making he had because of the huge sums involved and not only within the TWA itself, but with this commitment for these Boeing jets. And at that point, the bankers moved in and made him uh, put his stock in escrow, and they took over. I think that was in about 60 or 61. And at this point, uh, the new management came in. Ernie Breach came in, I think, as chairman of the board. And they had quite friction between Hughes and the management. I think it even went so far as suits were filed. So to settle it all, Howard, I guess, decided to sell all his stock. And the stock that he had, Jack Fry had bought for him in 1938, he sold at $7 a share, 7 or $8 a share. He sold for right at $100 a share in 1961, 62. Got out of well, uh, was Hughes a poor judge of character in uh, naming these various presidents that you had mentioned? I don't think Hughes was a poor judge of character. He had a man that worked for him that assumed a lot of responsibility named Noah Dietrich. Noah Dietrich was a financial man, and he wanted to run everything. And he ran the board of directors, even to the point where they all looked at him as to which way a director should vote. <laughs> and this fellow would make these recommendations to Hughes, and he'd have to. He was just sort of the, the, exec, the chief executive of the company, might say, at the top. And then Howard would acquiesce, and, and they'd elect him. That's how these people, you look back at well, off the record, those some of those people weren't outside of Damon. There wasn't a damn soul there that was worthy of being a president of an airline of that group. No background in that sort of thing. No. So uh, that's, I don't think it was Howard, I think it was Dietrich. And it got to the point where Dietrich later on fired, or Hughes later on fired Dietrich. And Dietrich wrote a book about it. I don't know some things <laughs> put his best foot forward, of course. Uh, well, did uh, Hughes show any uh, signs of the uh, recluse he was going to become later on, back then? Uh, I can't answer that. The last contact I had with Howard would be, uh, oh, probably in the early 50s. I did have contact with him in the late 50s, uh, just by telephone. But to talk to him was, would be the early 50s. And my understanding is that Howard Hughes got arthritis very badly in his hands, fingers. And he was a very proud fellow. I mean, he did not want to be seen with arthritis. And that's his physical condition caused him to become recluse. Now that's the most plausible story. I heard all kinds of stories, but uh, that's the most plausible one. And Jack Fry told me that, and he still he had this problem, but he he maintained the contact with Hughes. Well, his hearing went too. I understand. I I don't know about that. See, I, I'm talking about what kind of fellow he was when I knew him in the late '40s and early '50s, and he was a Pretty wonderful fellow. A little bit unusual, but uh, 
Did you uh, ever meet Dudley Sharp uh, during these years? He uh, grew up with uh, Howard Hughes in Houston, and he later became Secretary of the Air Force. No, I don't. I don't recall it. Lovett, Robert Lovett, was Secretary of the Air Force in World War II. Right. Well, this was some time later under Eisenhower that he no. was Secretary of the Air Force. No, I didn't. I didn't know. He told uh, some stories about uh, Howard Hughes in his early days. They were quite interesting. Well, I uh, talked to Howard at the length time. We flew together sometimes, the latter part of the war, the Constellation. I flew on flight. I got some pictures of him. And uh, he, he was a reticent. He didn't trust people. He, he was a very plausible person to be around. If he were sitting here, you'd enjoy talking to him, the same as it. But he was suspicious of people. He'd been taken so damn many times that he didn't trust any people on. And his first reaction, when somebody he didn't know or something like that had talked to him, well, he, his first reaction was, what does this fellow want? <laughs> now, that could give, him the wrong, give people the wrong impression of Howard Hughes, which many of them had. And he didn't like newspaper men, media people. Well, during your uh, early years with uh, what became TWA, you lived in uh, various places. Uh, your son notes that, uh, for example, that you lived in Kansas City and uh, Clovis, New Mexico. Why were you in these particular places at that time? Well, uh, Kansas City was headquarters of TWA. That's where it's located most of the time. When I was in Clovis, New Mexico, in Wynoke, Oklahoma, uh, I was there on a temporary assignment for a few months to relieve pilots. You see, it, I think we got a month's vacation each year, and if you had four pilots and flying out of Clovis, New Mexico, they decided to take May, June, July, and August off. I would go out the first of May and stay there the four months and relieve each one of them for a month. And it wasn't a, a really a permanent thing, it's sort of a temporary thing in Clovis and Winoka and Columbus, Ohio. But my main home in the early days was St. Louis, and then later it was moved to Kansas City. When did you meet your wife? I met her at Langley Field. Down when I was with the Second Bomb Marvin Group there in 1929, her father was stationed there. Oh, is she from a military family? Yes, her father was colonel in the Air Signal Corps for 39 years, and retired just before World War II. What grade did he retire at? He retired as colonel, full colonel. Promotions were hard to come by in those days. Oh, well, he did very well. Uh, your son has a note here about uh, the Northrop Alphas. What type of plane was this? The, the Northrop Alpha was a, the mail planes we used when uh, we got the mail contracts. Single engine, all metal plane, and uh, he carried the mail, carried about a thousand pounds of mail, wasp engine. Crews around 140 miles an hour, all metal. He used set in the back, open cockpit, on a parachute. <laughs> they get a little cold in those things? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, your son uh, has a note here also about uh, uh, when did you get to see or fly the first DC-1, 2, and 3? Well, the DC-1, uh, let me back up a minute. After TWA and Western Air merged, uh, and Jack Fry became executive vice president, Dick Robbins became president, they made plans to build a new aircraft called the DC-1. You remember the Ford was a tri-motor Ford, carried 10 passengers, two pilots. They wanted a plane that would carry at least 14 passengers, have a retractable landing gear, and cruise 
at 165 miles, I believe 65 miles an hour. The Ford would only cruise at 100. So uh, they surveyed, I've got a letter someplace, a copy of a letter where he sent out the inquiries on this particular plane somewhere. And uh, he uh, talked to various manufacturers. Finally, they decided for Douglas to build it. And one of the uh, things this, this plane had to do, to be a two engine, was to take off at Winslow, Arizona, which is the highest field west of the divide. And on takeoff, after he got airborne, cut one engine and fly with a full load on one engine across the hump to Albuquerque, New Mexico. That was the highest place en route. That was a requirement. So they built the DC-1, and it did. It did that. But then when they got to looking, wait a minute, I, must, I told you the wrong number of seats in that. When they got to looking at the, at the DC-1, it was it carried, I think it said 14, it carried only 10 pastures. They decided they'd want 14 pastures. So there are several other changes they wanted to make in it after the test look. So there was only one of those built. And then they went into building a DC-2. That was the second. That was the main plane. And the DC-2, the first one, uh, was delivered, and was first two or three were delivered and flying when Farley canceled the airmail in uh, January of 1934. And that was the airplane that put TWA in business, and they made money for a while, paid a dividend based on the DC-2s because they actually did cruise around 160, 165, and carried 14 passengers. Then, following that, when they got bigger engines, uh, the DC-3 was developed. Douglas built a DC-3, but it had larger engines than the DC-2, and the DC-3 would carry 21 passengers, twin-engine planes. And that was the stage. First the DC-1, which they built one, learned these things. Then they built a number of DC-2s. And then when they got larger engines developed and so forth, then they built the DC-3s. DC-3s came along in probably the late 30s. Mm -hmm. And of course, as chief wildlife flew them, you know, get them, check out on plot. I have several hundred hours on each one of those. Well, uh, I see in the note here that uh, you had a reputation as a wild flyer in the early days. I don't know where you got that. I, I didn't tell him that. <laughs> uh, I think I earned that uh, title with my airmail flying because uh, I was very much interested in instrument flying and I was a leader in, in that area. And, of course, I'm saying our pilots in those days flew by the seat of their pants. They flew by looking out, you see, breaking into their instruments. They watched the horizon. If you couldn't see the horizon, they were, they were in trouble. So when I speak of instrument flying, flying by the instruments through clouds and so forth, and you couldn't see, couldn't see anything. It was rain. And I probably was the leading one in that area, in the airline. And uh, they probably interpreted it doing that kind of work a while <laughs> pilot. Uh, were the uh, affairs going on in Europe uh, of any concern to you during this period? Before World War II? Yes. Uh, Did it appear ominous at that time? Slightly. Yes. Yes. Uh, I had some friends from uh, KLM, a Dutch airline, pilot, chief pilots, come over and visit with me and fly the line and you know, get acquainted, see what we were doing. We well, changed ideas. And he told me then, right prior to World War II, that the Germans had one of the finest fighter aircraft, and by being a fighter pilot, trained as a fighter pilot, pursuit pilot, in the world. And he said it was uh, called an ME-109. And he said the top speed of that thing was almost 300 miles an hour. And we didn't have anything that would go over 150, 75, not over 200. And he talked about that at length. So then we sent the uh, vice president of our company, Tommy Thomason, 
who was a Navy pilot in a while. Now, there was a wild guy. <laughs> over to Germany. He was invited over there to give a lecture or something. He went over to Germany. And he came back, and he was just uh, excited about the military strength of Germany, the aircraft, the tanks, the infantry, the artillery, everything just ready for war. And, of course, when Lindbergh came back from Germany and said the same thing, they took his commission away from him for saying that. Uh, these things were disturbing. Then, when Hitler... Uh, went through the Low Countries. No, let's see. He went into Poland for, uh, or no, no, no. Oh, he went in. He took Belgium, France. That's right. That's right. In I think that was in September of nineteen thirty-eight. Thirty-nine. It was thirty-nine. Uh, then when they had Dunkirk evacuation, of Dunkirk. Uh, this began to alarm people. And particularly so when the president, everybody was on the, took up for the allies, you know, and the Len Lease came on, things like this. Churchill came over and said, we don't want any soldiers, we just want pieces of equipment, we'll do the fighting. That was his first thing. Those things had an effect on it. And then, of course, uh, uh, the school I started out there where we started moving these airplanes across, they'd get shot down occasionally by a sub laying on the surface. Those kind of things uh, uh, were disturbing, to answer your question, yes. Do you think we, uh, you mentioned that we uh, weren't keeping up uh, in comparison to uh, what was going on in Europe in the way of aircraft development. And this same thing, uh, of course, held true in World War I, where we didn't have anything. Yeah. Well, now, there, I was speaking of military aircraft. Right. You see, this country was the leaders, and has been historically, in the airline aircraft department. The French have recently, with the Concorde, have done something, but uh, the A300, but uh, always the European airlines bought from Boeing or Douglas, so their airline air airplanes. And we were the leader in that field supreme. But where we were not the leader was in the military field. The Germans were ahead of us. The British Spitfire was a faster plane than what we had. And as you know, or you probably know, that during World War II, any plane that the design of which started after war was declared December the 7th, 1941, never reached combat during World War II. Not one. The B-29 B was the closest, but it was well underway when war broke out. And you take the, uh, the only one that had probably gotten fairly close was the Shooting Star, the Jet uh, Lockheed uh, P-40, I guess it was. She was close. So that there tells you something about our development. We had, uh, uh, fortunately, we had planes like the uh, P-51, and the Lockheed Lightning twin-engine planes, and uh, well, another fighter or two. P-47. P-47. But the main thing we only had then was the, uh, was the uh, P-40. P-39. P-39, which is cumbersome, slow planes. But unfortunately, we did have these others we put in production, and everybody started building. And you see, that brings a little history during... Uh, during Dunkirk, uh, the Germans thought they'd go there in a day and clean them out. Well, what happened was that the Spitfire defense and the Germans had their twin-engine bombers that they carried on it. And they lost, I think, almost 3,000 of them in that period of Battle of, of Britain to maybe seven or 800 Spitfires because the twin-engine bomber could not stand up to the fighter. So General Arnold, right after that one time, Jack Fry and I would go over to his office occasionally, told, said that uh, that brought forth the thing that uh, they must build a fighter and build the four-engine bombers with uh, armor plate. 
to protect themselves against the fighters. And that's when they settled on that. They built the fighters and the, the four inch and the B-17s with our armor plate and then the B-20s and the B-24s. So. That was, uh, uh, and, and see, of course, they had a few others. They had the uh, B-26 twin engine North American and the A-20, which was Douglas twin engine plane observation. And I was in England. I flew Mr. Lovett over in England. When the B-26, they were going to use them some in England. They sent 10 B-26s in low altitude across the channel to stay on the radar. And they sent them in to go in just five minutes and drop their bombs on this target and come back out. Five minutes in, five minutes out. Ten of them. Uh, just to, you know, test the pilots and test the... They sent them all in, not a one came out. They were jumping by any of these MA-109s. So all of that just strengthened this. We were big, big, big bombers, armor plate, and fighters. And of course, during World War II, they built over 300,000 airplanes were built in the United States. So this is the kind of thing. That you... uh, backing up a little bit, this uh, fellow Hertz that you mentioned earlier, is he the same one that uh, got into the car rental business? Yeah, that's the same one, John D. Hertz. Uh, you also mentioned this uh, difference of opinion between uh, Jack Fry and, and Hughes. What was the nature of this? Well, uh, it revolved around the f financial area I discussed to you. Jack felt that Howard should put up the forty million and let him sell the forty million of stock and go ahead. Howard said no. You're losing too much money. I think they'd lost $8 million, 46 or something like that. We just can't do it. Even Hughes Tool Company couldn't stand that. So this was the area which caused the trouble. It was not the operations, or not the operating of the airline. It was a financial matter that uh, created the difficulty. It wasn't a personality thing then? No, no. Jack liked, uh, liked Howard. And Howard liked Jack. They were very friendly and everything, but uh, it was strictly financial. All right. All right, in another note here, it says uh, to ask you about the testing of the straddle liner and the uh, freezing of the elevators above 23,000 feet. Uh, would you like to discuss that? It's always been amazing to me how simple some of our problems are in development work, but yet are completely overlooked. Let me give you a couple examples. I spoke previously about the pressurization of the Stratoliner. Well, all that means is that uh, all they did was put a pump, air pump, and would put five pounds air pressure in the passenger cabin. They built a plane so they'd hold air pressure, air. They put five pounds pressure in there. And that would let us fly the airplane at 20,000 feet. But as far as the passenger concerned, with the added five pounds pressure, he was down at 12, which is the maximum limit we got. That gave us a lot of latitude in flying. Well, any college sophomore <laughs> that's ever studied physics knows about uh, Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law says that if you take a volume of gas, hold it constant, volume constant, put it under pressure, the temperature will rise. But these engineers that did this decided Boyle's Law only applied on the ground, I guess. <laughs> so when I brought the first straddle liner in from uh, Seattle to Kansas City, it was a huge thing. Everything was, you know, was, everybody was out to see it, several hundred people out there watching it, all the employees and everything, because it had all this history and so forth. Um, again, as soon as I got out, the president uh, had his aide there, said he'd like to see me. So uh, 
I went uh, to his office and after the hullabaloo died down a little, and he said, uh, I've invited about 40 people to take a flight test tomorrow, have, to have lunch with me, and then take a flight in this new airplane. And my reply, he said, I'd like for you to get it ready and you fly it and take us on a flight around town so that'd be the first. This is going to be a signal occasion. This is going to make history. I said, well, that's all right, Jack, but I haven't been able to check the, the pressurization. I had a lot of other tests around and I'm down here from Seattle, and I haven't checked this thing out as early. I think you might be better wise to wait a few days and give me a chance to check it out and make sure. No, he said, we'll just take a short flight. He said, it's all laid on. He said, I can't change it now. <laughs> well, it was a hot summer day, so uh, he took him everything was, you know, just so-so, and he got his his uh, martini drinking group after lunch and got him in the airplane and I took off and went up and I was going up between five and six thousand feet bringing this pressure station in gradually, you know. And the hostess came running up. She said, Mr. Fry wants to see you. I said, well, tell Mr. Fry I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm busy with this pressure station right now. Well, she went back and told him, and here she come rushing up and said, Mr. Fry wants to see you now. And uh, I said, all right. And I got out of the old senior co-pilot. I said, you hold the controls and hold this here till I get back. And just as I went through the temperature, the door, I looked at the thermometer. It was 128 degrees in the passenger cabin. <laughs> all because of that pressure, you see. It was a very simple thing. Everybody was perspiring and sweating, you know, as they would, and the humidity and stink from those martinis. <laughs> 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 so a little simple. That was a very simple thing. All you had to do is take this pressure, put it up to five pounds pressure, and put it out and put it in a cooler where the cold air could blow through it and cool that pressure and then dump it in there and you controlled your temperature. But they didn't think of that when they put it in. Now, getting back to what you said there, this Stratoliner also had boost controls. Well, the, the reason the controls themselves, the ailerons, are just so heavy and so large on this large equipment that it's difficult for the pilot to pull the wheel. So they put on a little booster, a little hydraulic cylinder booster that whenever you'd move the control a little bit, the booster would help you move. Uh, and I'm making myself clear, they'd have a little cylinder right. on each elevator and each elevator and each aileron. Well, I took it up one day, the first one, I took it up around uh, 23,000 feet, and the controls locked. They absolutely locked. I couldn't move. The temperature there was about 20 below zero. And so I finally eased it down, got it eased down, and I got down closer to the ground. And when we got down to a little warmer atmosphere, why, it was, uh, they then began to work all right. And what happened then, we found out, was that uh, this cylinder, these cylinders, pistons are used, that coefficient expansion of the piston was greater than the coefficient expansion of the cylinder, and when it got on real cold, the, the uh, cylinder would lock on the piston. You couldn't move. And that's what he's referring to there. What, they redesigned the... Yeah, uh, put a different, uh, different cylinder. But someone just didn't think about those kind of things, you know. They're simple little things, but they could have called. You could have taken off on a on a flight where it's 20 below zero. You could have had a terrible crash, and no one had ever known what happened because you couldn't move the controls. Hmm. Well, it's a good thing you uh, didn't panic in that situation. <laughs> no, test pilot. I've done a lot of test work. You don't really. You don't think about things. The danger when you're in working with things. You're too busy trying to f handle things and figure out things. Well, how did you uh, get tied in with flying Roosevelt around? What was the uh, occasion for this? Uh, one morning, I had been. I was on this. I was in this division. I was running this division, flying from Cairo to uh, or Washington D.C. to Cairo, and. Uh, this, uh, I was in my office one Sunday morning. I'd been gone. I'd just come back from Africa. I'd been gone up through Casablanca and up through that area and up to Tunis around and there across the Sahara. And General Arnold's aide came over and said, the old man wants to see you. You know, you know, you know I referred to the Brendan Jones, the old man. And I said, uh, I was just sort of, you know, sport type clothes on Sunday morning. And, uh, he said, he, I said, well, when's you want me tomorrow? No, he said, he wants you now. 
So uh, we went over to see him, and he said, uh, he talked a little bit, and he was very friendly, and he said, Otis, uh, he said, um, the president, no, he didn't, he said, didn't say the president. He said, a very important person is going to take a very important trip overseas. And he said, uh, uh, Pan American will handle the flights over water, but I want you to handle the rest of them. I want you to fly them over the land and then do the combat zone and up Casablanca. And he didn't say Casablanca. No, he was very careful about that because he, you know, he said he's going to take an important trip and he said, I want you to be ready to go handle it. So then, uh, just the day before we got started, well, he called me back and told me exactly what was going to do. And he said, uh, General Arnold called me in and said, uh, told me then exactly what they were going to do. And he said, General Marshall and I are going over to uh, Casablanca first, and we want you to take us over there. And then Pan American will, he's going by boat down to Trinidad, and Pan American will take him over to uh, Bathurst, and you pick him up at Bathurst and fly him into uh, Casablanca. And then you f will fly him back to Bathurst, and then uh, Pan American will take him from Bathurst to Natal, and then you get to take him from Natal back up to Trinidad, and then he will come by ship from Trinidad back to Washington. So uh, uh, that was how that was laid on. I, flew them over and, and had my crew and everything and then came back and picked him up at uh, Bathurst. And uh, the president being in the physical condition and we had to build a ramp to roll him up in a wheelchair to get him in the airplanes. They built a uh, special elevator in... Uh, in the Sacred Cow, the last plane we had, yes, right. at Yalda. I understand that he was uh, partial to uh, going by ship, that he only flew as a last resort. Is that... Uh, Correct. Yes. Yes, that's true. He liked uh, he liked uh, ships, and he, he wasn't too. Uh, well, I think that was exaggerated a little. He always seemed to enjoy flying, but uh, I think the reason he wanted to go by ship, he had so much pressure put on him at home during these things that when he got in the ship, it'd give him a time to relax. So I think that was mainly it because he. He was always very interested in uh, in uh, flying. On uh, oh, on a trip from uh, second trip to Cairo and Tehran, I flew him over the. He always liked to know what he was doing. We had a window fixed by that time in the plane, and uh, I told him I had a couple places I'd like for him to see over there, and he said, "Wonderful, fine." He came excited. And I said, "One of them, I'm going to circle the." city of Bethlehem at a fairly low altitude so you'd get a chance. I said, I'll circle so you can see it. And then I said, I'm going to circle the uh, area where the Euphrates joins the Tigris River. In early days, that was supposed to be, the, as far as we know, the Garden of Eden. Cradle of civilization. Yeah, okay. So I did that. And oh, he was excited about that. He was, uh, then when he came home, he, he started uh, his speech to the nation. He started out, and he said, on such and such a date uh, at uh, altitude, I circled the beautiful city of Bethlehem, and he spent two or three minutes <laughs> discussing that. So, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't do that if he, he didn't, he didn't really dislike flying, but I think he, the relaxation he'd get from uh, resting on a ship was what he liked. Well, some people speculated that his early association, uh, I think he was an undersecretary of the Navy during World War I, uh, they think that he developed a partiality for it. Well, I think so. He was Navy-minded. No question about that. And, of course, he had quite a bit of Navy people around him. He had Admiral Leahy, Leahy the chief of staff of the Joint Chief of Staff, who made all major decisions. Then he had Admiral McIntyre, his uh, doctor, and then two or three other naval people around him. And about the only one he had from the Army was Paul Watson. And Paul was just an aide, just a likable character. <laughs> well, the first uh, flight you went on then was uh, the Casablanca flight? Yes. 
Well, could you uh, give me a little detail about that? Well, I picked the president up at Bathurst. That's on the west coast of Africa. And flew him about, uh, about four hours, I think five hours, northeast up to, uh, to Casablanca. And uh, then uh, we stayed there, I think, four or five days. And then I brought him back from Bla Casablanca to Bathurst. And then he caught the ship, or the Pan American plane, at Bathurst. And they flew him across the South Atlantic to Natal. Then I picked him up at Natal and flew him to Trinidad. And Trinidad, he took a surface vessel into Washington. That was, in essence, the itinerary of that flight. Well, at the uh, Casablanca conference, is this the first time you uh, encountered Churchill? Yes, yes. Well, could you give me a, your first impressions of this gentleman? Well, my impression of, uh, of Churchill then and is now or was that he was a, a very intelligent, foreseeing individual in the international affairs. Uh, he had an excellent personality. If he wanted to charm you, he was a delightful person to be around. And when he wanted to do that, but he was uh, uh, sort of a, normally a grouchy type of individual, the best thing. He was very vain. Before he'd get off an airplane, he'd get his hat just right or, and, step off, and then get that unlighted, new unlighted cigar in his mouth and then run around and step off, that kind of thing. But uh, he was uh, probably the most intelligent man I've ever met on the international affairs. And if we had listened to him and done some of the things he wanted us to do in World War II, I don't think we'd had all the problems we had at the end of the war. You recall he wanted us to go in through the soft underbelly of Europe, down through Greece and, and Turkey in that way, to eliminate what Russia did when Russia took, all, took over those Eastern European countries. He saw that. He wanted to avoid it. But uh, we took the position more strict the military that our job is to win the war and get out. And he was, he was a pleasant fellow to have around. He always let it, uh, President Roosevelt told me one time that he spent about three-fourths of his time when uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin were together, keeping Churchill from Stalin apart. That, uh, they were bitter enemies. They hated each other. And that, uh, Churchill hated Stalin for the 20 million people he killed in, prior to World War II, and Stalin never forgave him of it. This was, he said that, that's, that creates a real problem. But he wrote, that came from Roosevelt himself. Well, some uh, historians allege that uh, Roosevelt got too buddy-buddy with uh, Stalin during that period. I don't think that's true. He may have, but I don't think it's true. Roosevelt was, he, he was proper in these conversations and he was very careful of choosing his words and I don't think he got buddy-buddy with anyone, you know, real friends. I think he, he, re, he was more of a, of a intelligent man than that. Because that could be that could lead to disaster, you know, if he got to, if Churchill thought Roosevelt was tying in with uh, uh, with Stalin, you know, on things that could lead to international disaster. All right. After the Cas Casablanca flight, uh, what was the next uh, flight that you took Roosevelt on? Well, this was the one to Cairo and Tehran, and. Uh, when General Arnold told me about this one, he said he's going to take the cruiser Memphis to Iran, and you pick him up at Iran and uh, fly him to uh, to uh, Tunis, where General Eisenhower was, and then he said he'd gone to Cairo and then up to uh, Tehran. So, which we did. I picked him up at at Oran, and we flew up to Tunis, 
and then uh, the next night we flew on to Cairo. One of the problems I had in those days, you see, was uh, uh, when we would fly, we'd always be escorted when we were within range of the German Air Force by a group of P-38, or 30, P-36, what are those Lockheed, P-39s, not P-36s, fighters. And they were awful difficult to control. So uh, on this trip from uh, Iran to C Tunis, we had the fighters and hell, one group missed us and I had to wait for them and all this kind of trouble. So when we went to go from uh, uh, from Cairo, or Tunis to Cairo, well, I suggested to the commanding officer, I go at night, go out over the desert, stay away from the Germans out of range and it would be no problem. So we did that. And that was one of the things I always had to get because in taking uh, the president on a flight like that, every regional commander, you know, he wants to get in and be a part of the show or something. Those are problems that just naturally exist. According to uh, the book, The Flying White House, uh, you developed uh, hydraulic pump trouble uh, in a C-54 during your approach to Malta. Uh, could you describe that incident? Y yes. Uh, uh, when we started to put the landing gear down to land at Malta, the hydraulic pump failed. We, we pumped it, usually you'd pump it up and down. Hydra hi no, the hydraulic pump failed. So uh, we had to pump it down by hand. There's an alternative, not to pump it down by hand. And we got the landing gear down, but then we couldn't get the flaps down. So uh, I told the president that we'd land there, but we'd land you know, 20, 30 miles an hour faster than we normally would. And he said, well, go ahead and take all precautions and we'll all have a good time. He was that kind of a fellow. <laughs> so we did, and we landed. Of course, Malta had been bombed, bombed, bombed. The runway was pretty rough. But it worked out all right. We landed a little faster and stopped OK. No particular problem, but it's just landing fast on the bombed out airport. Could have caused some trouble, but it didn't. Were you able to get maintenance there? Yeah, we fixed a pump. It was a small item. The flight engineer, who was a well-trained mechanic, just went back and did some work on the pump. I don't know. I don't know. Forget it. Forget now. Just what it was. There's some item that he had to change on the pump. Broke or something. Put a new one on and went on. You also, during that uh, period, were dispatched to Turkey to pick up the uh, Turkish president. Could you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, that was a little hair-raising. Uh, president Roosevelt at Cairo wanted President Ananu of Turkey to come to Cairo for a conference. President Ananu, you can understand, because being neutral, wasn't very anxious to come, being as close to because I suppose he thought the Germans might retaliate. So he said he couldn't come. And then they talked, discussed for a while, and the president said, well, if you'll come, I'll send my own personal plane and pilot after you, bring you down here. So he agreed to that. Once more, we had the problem with, we see the, the Germans had fighter aircraft over there on Crete, within a fighter range of Turkey and so on. So there we had the problem of, again, the taking the P-38 fighters with us or not. and. Uh, they wanted to send uh, the fighters up with me. Well, I knew that if they sent the fighters up there and the Germans picked them up on radar, then we sure would have problems because they'd send all the fighters in the country out there after. So I suggested that uh, let me go alone and I would go out east of Cairo over the eastern edge of the end of uh, what is now Israel and up the river there and until I got even with Turkey, and then fly west to this airport where I'd pick up the president of Turkey, which was at Adena, Turkey. And I would land at Adena between uh, sundown and dark. And then we'd pick him up. He used to be there at 3 o'clock the next morning, and then we'd take off before it got daylight and come back to Cairo. We'd stay low so the radars, enemy radar, couldn't pick us up. 
And I felt, and uh, the commanding officer felt, that was the best thing to do. But the fighter pilots and their commanding officer thought that was ridiculous, you know. But I thought that was the only thing, worst way to do, because if you, got, if you got, ever got in trouble and got German fighters attacking you, well, hell, they'd, they'd knock an old C-54 out of the sky, nothing flat. <laughs> so we did that. And I landed at this airport between uh, uh, sundown and dark, about ten minutes after sundown. Taxi over the commanding officer, the Turkish commanding officer, met me and we parked the plane. He took me over to the officer's club to have coffee. It's a god-awful coffee, that Turkish coffee. <laughs> a bite to eat. And uh, we hadn't been there 15 minutes till uh, the whole room exploded. The radio was on. And Lord Haw Haw had come on and said that uh, that uh, Colonel Otis F. Bryan of the American Air Force had just landed at Adena and was going to pick up President Anano and take him to Cairo tomorrow morning. That was 15 minutes after we landed. All the work we'd gone through to get this, keep this secret. You know. So the commanding officer almost fainted when he got that. <laughs> but uh, what happened was stopped to think of We wondered how in the world that ever occurred. Stop happened was, you see, they apparently had a spy in the control tower, the, uh, the Turkey control tower. The Germans did. And all he had to do was go out to wherever his transmitter was and tell Berlin, and they phoned it over to Hee and he put it on the air. Who was this Hee Haw, you would tell? Well, don't you remember? He was a famous Englishman that uh, broadcast out of Berlin uh, oh yeah. For uh, Germany and uh, everything, he was, uh, spoke in English mainly to, to the Allies from Berlin, broadcasting for the German Air Force, and some of the stories he'd he'd tell. <laughs> but that was a bit exciting. And but then the uh, next day, hell, the damn president didn't come until eight o'clock the next morning. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, so I took off with him anyway, and we went east and went around there. And, He's a very nice fellow, President. He sat up in front of the co-pilot seat most of the way. He'd been a colonel in the World War I over that area, and he showed me the battlefields where he had been uh, uh, in fights. He spoke English? Yes. Uh, so that was my trip to Ad Adena. But the uh, Germans didn't give you any opposition then no, when you flew them out. I saw sign them. I I come to think of it, I think the military had it over exploded, over extended because uh, you think of it. Well, the Germans aren't going to knock down any neutral president, you know. The hell, he was, They want to keep on his good side just as much as uh, as he wanted to stay friendly, or, you know, stay neutral. And they had they had their greatest. Uh, and they had the ambassador who was the greatest crook in the world there, Von Papen. Does that ring a bell with Von Papen, Ambassador Von Papen? Oh, yeah. He was a master at spying stuff like this and getting information. So I think when after I thought it all through and thought about it several times, I thought, well, that's, they just didn't want to interfere there with that. Because had they done it, then that, that would have uh, created uh, a terrific amount of... Uh, of uh, cohesion among the Allies, they had to put every effort they had then to wipe the Germans out and so forth, you know, something like that. And it wouldn't have done them any good. Well, if they knocked him out, it wouldn't have wouldn't have affected anything, because he was the top, and somebody else had moved right in. And I just felt that they they knew about it, but didn't didn't want to take any action. <laughs> um, All right. Uh, According to the note here, you, uh, uh, in addition to uh, the president of Turkey, you also flew uh, both Eisenhower and Churchill. Eisenhower, several times, not Churchill. Churchill had his own uh, plane and had his own pilot, who was a good friend of mine, American pilot that flew him. And I never did, no, I never did fly Churchill. When did you fly Eisenhower then? Well, uh, Read the note. Uh, 
to Captain Otis Bryan, my first transatlantic pilot, and my friend with lasting regard. Uh, that was my first ship. He flew with us several times. Dwight Eisenhower. He had one star when he, when he I took him over. And what year was this? Forty-one or this was in uh, about March of forty-two. That I had quite a load on that trip. General Arnold called me over and said, uh, as he did on most of these important, said we got a load of brass going to Prestwick. He said, can you take them personally? And I said, sure. Of course, you always had to say yes, sir. You know. <laughs> and on this trip, we had. Harry Hopkins, Abel Harriman, Mark Clark, who had one star, Eisenhower, who had one star, Admiral Towers, Hoyt Vandenberg, who was only a colonel, later chief of staff, and a couple other importance, all on this flight. And I took them over and we ran into bad weather right off the coast of Greenland. It got iced, plane got iced up. And I had to take them back and lay overnight at Gander. And we didn't want to take off to Gander until later in the afternoon. And we shot skeet on the skeet, Gander. <laughs> I beat, I, I was a pretty good trap shooter. And I think I got 24 out of 25. That was the top score and I beat General Eisenhower. I had to do over again, I'd never do that again. <laughs> but he'd get a big kick out of that. And then uh, he was with us on several of the presidential trips. He flew with us from uh, the trip to Iran to Cairo, or to Tunis, I was talking about, to Cairo. How did you uh, appreciate his personality? I liked him immensely. I think Eisenhower was one of the finest men this country's ever produced. He, he, his strength was in, uh, we all have, we're all intelligent in certain ways, different, entirely different fields. Uh, I can best illustrate that by uh, a Kansas City reporter, for one of the top papers in Kansas City during my early days with TWA. He thought pilots were dumb. And I agreed with him. I wouldn't argue with him against that. And he made he's little got a little obnoxious about it. So uh, one Sunday morning, I had to test fly one of these Stratoliners just to make sure it was working. And it was a very easy plane to fly. If you just leave it alone, it'd fly straight. So I invited him to go along. And he said, "Sure, he'd like to." So I got him in, and we took off. We got climbing around. I did my test working. And asked him, I said, here, you, t you, you take a hold of it. He was in a co-pilot seat, and you fly it. He took a hold of the wheel. I got up and went back in the passenger cabin. Well, the first thing he did, he started over control. <laughs> he got the plane going like this. As he started sweating, and I was down over there looking over his shoulder. <laughs> if he just took his hands off, it would have been smooth. He'd straightened out. You know. But he did all this, and then when he got, looked like he was going to get in trouble, I, I went up and slapped his hands and just hold it steady. I got it. And uh, he did, and of course the plane leveled up. I said, you, surely this man as intelligent as you are and no more than a dumb pilot and hold that wheel stand. <laughs> <laughs> he laid off of us after that. <laughs> but that, getting back to Isaac, we all have our knowledges in certain fields, no matter. Doctor's a good doctor and a hell of a poor lawyer. A lawyer's a good lawyer, but he thinks he knows a lot about everything. Sometimes gets him in trouble. So Eisenhower's was his ability to get people to work. And he told me one time, he said, that when he went to London, first with the British, and there was quite a cleavage between British and American soldiers, he said, my biggest job was to get American officers and British officers working together. So he said, whenever I had a vacancy to fill, if I had to put a colonel uh, in some place, I would put a British colonel and an American colonel together and put them, assign them both to the job. And he said they'd start working together. In a few days, they found out they were a lot alike. And he said they'd become close friends. And uh, no problem. He said, took care of that. He said, that's the way I got around a lot of those things. And his, his ability was in the areas 
probably best to describe as the chairman of the board, to get people to work together. And he had an excellent military mind. And you will recall when on the invasion, when it looked bad, he wrote his speech out there on the beach. He said, this responsibility, of this disaster was my responsibility and mine alone. And that's the type of man he was. I understand that uh, Field Marshal Montgomery taxed his uh, oh, patients. <laughs> I, I didn't know him, but I, I, some of the stories I heard, no one get along with him. He had an ego three miles wide, yes. from what I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, did you have any other associations with Eisenhower other than what you mentioned here? Yes, I saw him several times, and I flew him. Well, before he got his own plane over in England, uh, you know, his, he first had a DC-2, but would go on trips like that. He'd always be with the president. He was always happy. And then we saw Mamie, his wife, and a friend of ours in Washington. And then when he came home, he had the big dinner in New York, uh, you know, the reception, formal thing. Governor Lehman gave for him and everybody in New York. And he had his... Uh, group there and uh, hundreds of people, all formal. We went. We were invited. And I went down the reception line like Governor Lehman and, and I don't know, the mayor of New York and General Eisenhower were there all shaking hands with us went by. And we got within uh, three or four feet, wasn't it? Four or five feet of General Eisenhower. And I hadn't seen him for a year or two at the end of the war. And he saw me, and he, he, he yelled, in a, not a yell, but he said in a loud voice, Jesus Christ, Otis, where in the hell have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that upset the governor. <laughs> but that's the kind of fellow he was. Was he one of these uh, fellows that had a photographic memory in regard to, to names? I understand some of those uh, uh, people uh, like Eisenhower had a, uh, a I never noticed it if he did. I doubt that. Because I recall now some questions he'd asked that uh, he, he had a good mind. He had a photographic mind for important things that he wanted to remember. But I don't think he, he's not like Jim Farley you're speaking of, you know, he'd remember names too well. But he, he'd remember names, sure, of his friends. But I don't think he had any kind of a unusual memory in this regard. You mentioned uh, General Marshall uh, several times. How well did you get to know him? Not too well, but fairly well. I flew him on several trips, and of course, when you have dinner with him on the trips, I was always invited to have dinner with him and you know be around him. And he was very much interested in that first presidential flight. He told me when I went back to to uh, he was at Casablanca, and when General Arnold called me in, when General Marshall was there, and told me about going back to Bathurst to get President Roosevelt, and General Marshall took over right then, and he said, if you have, if you have any problem, you take this, and he gave me a, yeah, that you take this, he gave it to me, his little letter that Otis Bryan was in complete command of this aircraft and so forth, and that he was not to be interfered with by any officer of the U.S. Army, period. That his decision would be final. Something to that effect, very polite and very nice. But I never had to use it. I, a couple of times I probably should have, but I didn't. I'd rather talk my way out of it than <laughs> cause somebody trouble. And uh, I didn't get to know him uh, too well, but he was, uh, he was very friendly, very nice. For occasions I did have with him. I knew Eisenhower and Roosevelt got a bit better, and Lay, uh, but he was a brilliant tactician. He, he, now he was the one that had the military mind, General Arnold did, or General Marshall did. I understand that uh, he had such a striking uh, appearance and almost uh, commanded any situation to the point where uh, he overawed uh, those in his presence. In fact, uh, I read where even President Roosevelt even called him General Marshall. He never used yeah, first name. That's true. That's, that's true. He had. Uh, 
here you can see what uh, uh, with appreciation for his skillful piloting to Africa with warm regards George C. Marshall I flew him on I guess two or three trips to Africa but you, you can see there what you're talking about you see, he was, he was not a stuffed shirt or anything like that, not this man like King. King was a son of a bitch in the Navy. <laughs> but he was, this fellow was very friendly, and, and, and he, you can see there, that's, he just dominated any group he was in. A very commanding presence. Right. Did you have any dealings with King? No. I uh, interviewed his son-in-law, uh, General... Fred Smith here several years ago. Yeah. Well, I suppose King was a nice fellow, probably if you got acquainted with him, but he was, he run a very tight sh ship, you know, in the Navy, and he thought he had to be tough, and he was tough. And I think it was a, more like a patent act. He put a lot of that stuff on. It probably was not really King, but he just, his act. <laughs> in the notes here, it mentions that uh, you also uh, met General Curtis LeMay sometime uh, back in your early career. Could you discuss that? Yes, I met Kirk uh, 